Assalamu alaikum. Hello everyone. This video explains the Modigliani and Miller, shortly known as MM theory of capital structure. As the title suggests, it explains the propositions without corporate taxes. In the follow-up video, I will try to explain what happens to MM propositions if we do consider corporate taxes as well as personal taxes. Modigliani and Miller, in their initial paper in 1958, put forward two propositions. And they call those propositions to be Proposition 1 and 2. Proposition 1 is named as the Capital Structure Irrelevance Proposition, and it talks about the value of the firm. Whereas Proposition 2 talks about the cost of capital and is known as the cost of equity and leverage proposition. Let's talk about the first proposition. It says that value of the firm is unaffected by a capital structure and therefore the capital structure is irrelevant. By irrelevance, it doesn't mean that we don't need to understand capital structure. Rather, it means that it doesn't matter by how much percentage you finance your assets in whatever mix of debt and equity, it is not going to affect the value of the firm. You can make an analogy of Proposition 1 with a cake. Let's assume this is a cake. According to MM, the size of this cake is actually the value of the firm. And it doesn't matter in how much slices you cut it. So if we cut it into equal pieces, or if we cut it in four pieces, and so on, it is not going to affect the size of the cake per se. Proposition 2 talks about cost of equity and leverage. It says that cost of equity increases linearly as firm increases its proportion of debt financing, leaving the weighted average of its costs of debt and equity unchanged. In other words, the weighted average cost of capital, or VAC, remains unchanged, irrespective of the percentages of debt and equity. In order to clarify both of these propositions, we first need to understand what actually is value of the firm. In finance, value actually means the cash flows or more specifically, we would like to call them as free cash flows. Free cash flows or FCF are calculated as net income plus interest, less of taxes, plus non-cash expenses, which might include depreciation as well as amortization, less capital expenditures for the year. In order to simplify our calculations, we're going to make some assumptions. And we are going to assume that non-cash expenses and capital expenditures are exactly the same, so that they cancel out each other, and we are left with only net income plus interest. These two items are also known as net operating profit after taxes, or NOPAT, and can also be calculated as earnings before interest and taxes multiplied by 1 minus tax rate. So if we use this formula or add these two items, both will give us the same result. Let's try to understand MM propositions with the help of a hypothetical example. I'm considering four debt levels starting from 0% debt financing. 10%, 20%, and 30%. Let's say the total capital of the firm is 1 million, which will remain the same for all the levels of debt financing. That means, for instance, if I'm using 10% debt financing, so the same amount is used to repurchase the required number of shares, leaving the total capital of the firm unchanged. So 
if we find weight of equity and weight of debt, in the first situation, since there is no debt financing, so the whole 1 million is equity capital. Therefore, the weight of equity in the first situation is 100%, or we'll write 1. And the weight of debt would be 0. In the second situation, if I'm financing 10% of my capital with debt, that leaves 90% of the capital to be financed with equity. So I'll write 0.9 here and 0.1 in the weight of debt category. And so on, we can fill up the rest of the cells. The cost of debt is assumed to be 8% for all the debt levels. Though in reality it might not be the case, since the more debt financing is used, the higher is the cost of debt. But for the sake of simplicity, we are assuming that the cost of debt is 8% for all the debt levels. I'll be starting my analysis with earnings before interest and taxes, or EBIT, which is assumed to be 150000 for all the debt levels. The next item is the interest cost. Since in the first scenario there is no debt financing, so my interest cost would be zero. In the second case, I'm using 10% debt financing. That means 10% of my total capital makes 1 lakh, so I'll be multiplying 1 lakh with 8% cost of debt. That will give me the interest expense for the second case. In the third situation, I'm using 20% debt financing, so I'll be multiplying 2 lakhs with the cost of debt. And in the same way, we can find the last value as well. So this is 3 lakhs multiplied by the cost of debt because I'm using 30% debt financing in the fourth case. Next would be earnings before taxes, which will be calculated as EBIT less of interest cost. The next item would be corporate taxes. But since we are trying to understand MM's propositions without the corporate taxes, so my value of tax in all the four cases would be zero. That means my net income and earnings before taxes are exactly the same. And I'm going to make another assumption here, which is that the firm pays all of its net income into dividends. That means the payout ratio is 100%. So the value of dividend would be exactly the same as net income. Now, in order to prove MM's proposition 1, which is regarding the valuation, we need to calculate the free cash flows. Using the free cash flow formulas that I showed earlier, we can find FCF here, which is equal to earnings before interest and taxes multiplied by 1 minus tax. Since there are no taxes, so my tax rate would be 0. We can also find FCF with the second formula, which is equal to net income plus interest multiplied by 1 minus tax, which is, of course, 0 again. We made an assumption earlier that my capital expenditures and depreciation expenses are exactly the same. Therefore, my free cash flow formula is reduced to only net income and interest cost. We can see here that value of the firm is same at all the debt levels, which actually proves MM Proposition 1 without the inclusion of corporate taxes. Now let's try to prove MM's Proposition number 2, which is regarding the weighted average cost of capital or VAC, and that says that VAC of the firm should remain unchanged. But in order to find VAC, 
we need one more item that is the cost of equity which i don't have it yet i do have the weightages and i do have the cost of debt but i don't have cost of equity but i can find cost of equity with a formula that is by dividing the dividend amount over book value of equity which is nothing but the return on equity so i will be finding cost of equity as the amount of dividend divided by book value of equity since in the first case there is no debt financing so my whole 1 million is actually the equity capital so i'll be dividing 150000 dividend over 1 million that gives me a cost of equity of 15% in the second situation my weight of equity is 90% which means i'll be dividing the amount of dividend over 9 lakhs and in the same way we can find the remaining values as well now i have all the ingredients to find the weighted average cost of capital let's try to find the weighted average cost of capital here vac would be calculated as the weight of equity multiplied by cost of equity plus weight of debt multiplied by cost of debt since there are no corporate taxes so i will not be adjusting my cost of debt for taxes i'll be considering the whole eight percent to be my cost of debt the first value is the same as the cost of equity at zero percent debt financing which is quite intuitive because my total cost of capital is nothing but the cost of equity because i don't have any debt if i drag the formula to the rest of the cells we can see an astonishing result we have just proved mm proposition number two which says that the weighted average cost of capital is unchanged and it remains the same irrespective of the debt financing the reason why vac is not changing is because of the fact that with increasing level of debt financing the cost of equity is rising and the increase in cost of equity is synchronized with the increase in the cost of debt so that on average the cost of capital remains the same this is what is meant by the term linear increase that means if the cost of debt increases the cost of equity increases linearly with the same magnitude therefore the average remains the same alternatively if we are to consider these free cash flows to be projected ones we can discount them back at the weighted average cost of capital in order to find the value of the firm since we don't have any projected number of years therefore we can consider all these free cash flows for a single point in time in future which may remain the same perpetually therefore we can simply divide this value over vac in order to find the value of the firm so value would be equal to free cash flows divided by vac and that will give us the value of the firm since the free cash flows and vac are not changing therefore the value of the firm is also unaffected this is another way of proving mm propositions one and two without corporate taxation so this was all about a basic understanding of the mm theory of capital structure considering both propositions one and two without corporate taxation in the follow-up video i will try to explain what happens to these propositions if we do consider the corporate taxes as well as personal taxes if you think this video helped you please like it and subscribe to my channel simply finance if you have any question you can post it in the comment section and i'll be glad to answer that thank you very much allah office